obviously I'm an academic, so I have to have lots of slides. Um, mm -hmm. It comes comes with the territory, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, if you've got any like, any stuff that you want to um, mention as you go along, Beth's going to be monitoring the um, chat stuff. Um, so do just put stuff in there. And um, Beth, if someone's wanting something clarified, just just interrupt me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's not a problem. Um, and uh, I think that's about it really. So um, just to obviously just to keep reminding you about that chat function and hopefully you've all managed to find it now. So um, yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is actually about recovery strategies for fencing. Um, for me, this is something that I find a really interesting topic. Um, it's something that I've sort of, it's not something I've particularly researched, I must confess, but it's something that I'm often reading about and I think it's quite um, important for what we do. And I think it's something that we probably don't, I know as a fencer, I didn't put enough time or thought into my recovery and it's something I think we should probably start looking into more. Um, and anyways, this is just the title thing. Um, you can see my Twitter in case you want to tweet anything. It's a very exciting, at Bottoms Lindsay. I did have Lindsay Bottoms, but then my account got hacked. So um, I <laughs> ended up having to go to a new one. So it's Bottoms Lindsay. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'm gonna start this off. Um, so I just need to get minimize my video. Okay, yeah. So essentially what I want to talk to you about is why is recovery important to start thinking about that sort of element of it? Um, what recovery strategies there are out there um, and whether you've used any of them? Um, and we can sort of explore some of them. I'm not gonna go into every single one of them, but we're gonna start exploring them and what uh, the potential benefits and, um, and stuff are. Um, and and that's something I think uh, I'm actually really interested in. And again, I've not done much work myself so much on it, um, but it's to how to monitor recovery and fatigue. And I think this is something a lot of football clubs do, um, a lot of uh, professional sports do. And I think it's something we should actually really start to consider and look at as how how we're recovered, uh, whether we're recovered. So essentially, that's what I'm just going to go through in this sort of uh, session. Um, so why is recovery important? The, the big question. And um, I'm assuming you've all woken up with that um, massive aches and pains in your body. Unfortunately, it happens to me far too often, um, especially these days as I'm getting older. Um, but we often call that sort of pain or muscle soreness, delayed onset muscle soreness, and we call it DOMS for short. So if I refer to DOMS throughout the talk, um, that's what I'm referring to. So obviously you do that activity, um, so you do your, your workout, um, it could be your fencing training, it could be your competition. Um, and then the next day you're feeling tired, but not too bad. And then the third day, you're, you're, or the day after, you're, you're feeling in quite a lot of pain when you walk down the stairs or when you're going up the stairs. Usually it's when you're walking down because it's that eccentric, that lengthening of the muscle uh, contraction as you're going down the stairs that you're st really starting to feel that pain. Um, as I said, unfortunately, it happens to me, uh, sadly, far too often these days. So the reason we want to recover is mainly to try and prevent this uh, soreness from happening and to be able to maintain performance a following, um, a following day or, or whatever. But we also need to be careful of overtraining. Um, and we also have overreaching and overreaching is is where you're. you're you're starting to get really tired, but you're not quite at that overtrain. If you're overtrained, then that's a really bad point that you get to, and, and it can end up meaning quite a lot of time out of the sport. But overreaching is what most people probably experience when you've just done too much. Um, and you start getting quite grumpy. So you start having mood swings. Um, you actually, your resting heart rate is elevated because you're not um, recovered properly. Uh, loss of appetite. Um, so you, you tend to lose your like your hunger, you have constant fatigue. So these are sort of signs of overtraining um, and, uh, and recovery can help us prevent some of these. So uh, that's sort of some of the main reasons for doing it. But in terms of recovery, the types of recovery, I was thinking about it in terms of fencing, because obviously I'm going to be talking quite generically for a lot of this, but then I want us to put it into that fencing concept, which is what, what we're all interested in. Um, so if we look at recovery and fencing, you, you've got the recovery between points. So you're, you're doing a fight um, and you're, you're scoring hits. And that obviously there's that little bit of recovery as you're going back to the on guard line. 
and I um, and, and we'll come like we'll start explaining what recovery you might be using at the end of the presentation. But that's one element where we might want to consider recovery between fights. So you've done your fight and then you've got to prepare for the next fight. Um, I would say in particular, when you're looking at your DE fight, so you do your last 64 and then you get ready for your last 32. How are you going to prepare yourself and look at that at recovery? And then you've done your competition and you've got um, the team competition the next day or the day after. How are you going to recover ahead of that? And then obviously just your training recovery. So you do your training sessions. It could be fencing. It could be uh, your strength and conditioning sessions. It doesn't matter. But you've got to recover from that. Um, and then one I always think is a fascinating one is a training camp. Suddenly, um, and I, I think for us, a lot of us um, who maybe don't always do as much training as potentially we should, uh, we go to a training camp and suddenly you're doing day after day after day and we are wrecked. So obviously you've got recovery um, during the training camp that you need to consider as well. So I was just trying to think of how recovery fits into us as fences. And these are sort of the key elements that I was thinking of. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is where I wanted a little bit of input and you can put it into the chat and um, I'm gonna get Beth to talk back at me. Um, but essentially I, I was curious as to, before I start talking about the different strategies and, and, and whether they're beneficial potentially or not, I just was interested to see if any of you guys use any recovery strategies and if you've tried any. So it's whether you could put into the chat if you've used recovery strategies and which ones you've done or you've used. I'm just curious as, as a group whether you're already implementing stuff into your uh, fencing life. <laughs> Nothing's coming up just yet. Oh, uh, Simone um, is stretching. Yeah. Uh, Andy, uh, Andy has done ice baths. <laughs> so, uh, hot baths. You're braver than me with the ice baths. Yeah. So, Sheila's tried hot baths. Duncan, ice bath, compression tight, tight snacks, and recovery drinks. Uh, Hugh, mm. uh, uh, in long gaps between phases of. A competition, you lie down with feet elevated and eyes shut. Uh, Sean Beautyman, uh, not sure about what you'd consider as a strategy, but feeding between bouts and cooling and loosening kit. Uh, Lynn Robinson, uh, don't know whether it counts as sports mm -hmm. massage. Everybody's got a little bit, not quite sure now. I thought it was quite good, but a little <laughs> bit lack of confidence. Uh, John Prem, uh, stretching and protein bars. Nicola is mainly physical recovery, but rarely mentally. Um, Simone is, oh, and sleep. <laughs> nice. So I think most of you then have, have actually considered recovery. And I see that a lot of you have got, um, have tried different strategies. And actually it's quite interesting that most of you are doing different ones, uh, which is quite interesting in itself. Um, psychologically, I'm not gonna be talking about those. Obviously that's uh, Jonathan Katz is probably your expert in terms, in terms of that side of things. Uh, but obviously I'm going to be focusing on that physiological recovery. Um, and the other thing that I will say is I'm not looking at this when I'm telling you information and, and, and what I've read and, and the, what the literature is showing. And as I said, I am an academic, so I'm going to come at you with um, from from the research perspective. Um, I'm not looking at it as an injury prevent, uh, preventing injuries. I'm looking at it in terms of getting ready to do your next training session in a sense of physiological recovery. So um, there are all sorts of uh, techniques and most of them actually you've just mentioned yourselves. Um, we've got sleep and I think um, we often forget about sleep and that's probably one of our, that's our body's most effective recovery strategy. Um, hydration, um, someone mentioned about hydration there and that is a, a recovery strategy. Um, and I'm going to talk about these ones in, in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, nutrition. So obviously you've got um, your, your fuel replenishment that you need to consider, protein potentially, um, and functional foods. Um, active recovery. So someone, uh, well, you can just sort of walking up and down, running, jogging, just getting the legs going. So you're just recovering that way. Uh, massage, foam rolling, stretching, all things that you've uh, just mentioned. The, the cold water immersion, the ice baths, the hot water immersion, sort of hydrotherapy, I'm, I'm classing that all as. 
Um, so these are all different types of recovery and compression garments. I think Duncan mentioned those ones. There's also electromyostimulation. So the idea is you use electrodes and it, and it contracts uh, the muscles and it sort of helps flush out the metabolites that have built up. And I'm not going to touch on that one today, but essentially, you know, these are the sort of different recovery strategies that you could use to help um, get yourself ready for the next fight or it could be the next point. Um, you know or the next competition or whatever so i'm going to try and discuss these and i'm going to then try and put it back into that context at the end so um sleep i did want to find one of crumble actually but um i, did, I realized um that, but for some reason i decided not to I use this picture actually <laughs> um so but sleep as i said it's one of our body's efficient ways to recover and it's a natural thing um, we all know that on average we should sleep about eight hours a night and I suspect the majority of people don't manage to get sort of eight hours sleep a night um, but if you look on the right here of this slide um, this is just a I'm using a lot of infographics I found online um, and uh, but you can see on this one sprint time significantly um, D, I'm going to say is, is significantly worse. It's the higher line. So sprint time is actually increased if you have less hours of sleep. So six and a half hours versus 10 hours of sleep. Um, so again, performance is de like it's decreased without question of a doubt. The literature is quite um, certain that if you are sleep deprived, you will not perform as well. It could be in terms of sprinting, endurance, all sorts of different um, activities is, is not so good to... Um, if you get around eight hours of sleep, then you, 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 your performance is gonna be fine. It's not affected. If you start getting less than that, even seven and a half hours, seven hours, it actually starts to deteriorate. Um, and what they're finding is if you oversleep, so you sleep something like 10 hours as in this uh, figure here, you actually get an improvement in performance. So rest and sleep are really important. And part of that is because that's when we our body actually recovers, so um, we get um, muscle um, it's actually one of the time where you get most um, muscle synthesis so building of muscles uh, which is why actually having protein just before going to sleep is supposed to be very good it actually helps promote that overnight um, so actually yeah your, your body's repairing itself overnight so sleep is really important um, and part of that is due to an increase in growth hormone to help with that so if you not don't sleep enough you're not going to have that repairing process um, you're more likely to get injured if you don't have enough sleep, um, you are um, your, your reaction times decrease. Um, you um, actually get more inflammation. So you're more likely to get more DOMS um, if you have adduction in sleep. And one of the things that I've, I find, um, and I don't think there's a solution to this, is actually um, looking at the timing of when you do exercise. If you do exercise last thing at night, your sleep is worse. It takes longer to go to sleep and the quality of sleep is often worse. And obviously as, as fences, our training is often late at night. And that's just because it's nothing we can do in terms of changing that. It's usually to do with availability of sports halls. Obviously people go to work and then they need to do the exercise and you know after that. So it's not like we can go and tell um, fencing clubs they have to change their tires because it's not great. But it's just, unfortunately that's a situation that we, we find ourselves in. But it's something to consider that the later you do exercise, the worse your sleep is going to be because you're more aroused at the end of it and it's harder to get to sleep. And so obviously that affects uh, your um, recovery in itself. Um, something you can do, though, obviously, is if you've not managed to get enough sleep, you can actually have power naps. Um, and I'm just going to quickly say something else here. So you'll see that I've taken a lot of these uh, infographics from a website called y, uh, YLMS, like YLM Sport um sci i think it is at the end sci basically there's this guy and he puts all the latest research into infographics and it's a really good way to see what's um current in terms of uh in the sports science world so if you do like some of this stuff it's, it's probably worth going on and having a look and he's summarized all sorts of nutrition stuff uh recovery stuff all sorts of stuff so i've digressed slightly but it's worth uh, checking him out um so i'm going back to my power naps um they reckon 15 to 20 minutes 
can suddenly improve a lot of the things that were um, detrimental from sleep deprivation. And one of the things they also recommend is to have a shot of caffeine uh, prior to your power nap. So when you do wake up, you feel alert because it takes a bit of time for caffeine to get into the system. So it's not going to stop you from having that nap because it's not quick enough for it to be um, absorbed or taken into the system. Um, but by the time you've woken up from your nap, you have the effects of caffeine. So it's actually one of the things that they do recommend. Um, but it does boost your sort of uh, memory. It boosts your cognitive functions, so your, um, your reaction times and all this. Um, and actually, it just generally can help with some of the negative uh, effects of sleep deprivation. So if you can, maybe have some naps at a fencing competition. It might actually help. Um, or, you know, just but it's something to consider if you're doing a lot of training, if you're at training camp or something like that and you aren't getting enough sleep, um, it is worth having your power naps. In terms of hydration, um, again, actually, there, there isn't actually much um, with regards to muscle soreness. You know, I mentioned that at the beginning, we're looking at our DOMS. Hydration um, hasn't actually been researched that much to see if it actually has an impact on muscle soreness. But they are actually finding that if you're dehydrated and you don't rehydrate, you can actually um, worsen your muscle soreness, so your DOMS. It takes longer for it to, to go. So hydration obviously is important throughout competition anyways um, to maintain performance. But in terms of recovery, you do not recover in terms of muscle soreness as well if you're dehydrated still. Um, the other thing that I would say is if you are dehydrated, what tends to happen is your blood volume will decrease. So if you've been sweating in fencing, um, and you haven't replaced enough fluid, um, your blood volume will decrease. And so then your heart has to work harder for the same absolute intensity. And so your heart rate is higher at, um, when you're fighting. So it, it makes performance worse if you're dehydrated. But I have to admit the research that my PhD student has done in recent years on, on the fencing has actually shown that um, generally fences are taking enough fluid and board anyways uh, with regards to training so I think I think we've done enough over the years to know that hydration is important and I think fences tend to be aware of this and are drinking um, seem to be drinking enough fluids to replace it but it will have a negative impact on muscle soreness if you don't replace enough fluids in terms of what that fluid might look like um, something that uh, we often say is about carbohydrate um, drinks like Lucozade Sport, Gatorade, things like that. Um, and I, in terms of performance, yes, it can be beneficial. The only thing that I would say is sometimes, especially it depends, it depends how hard you've been working really. Um, I sometimes think that we don't burn as many calories as we perceive when we fence. So carbohydrate is, is one of these things. If, if you're doing a long competition, yes, I think you, know, you need to replace your fuel. Um, but if you're good, if you're used to getting knocked out at the end of the first DE or something, you've not actually burned so many calories that you need to be taking on lots of carbohydrate. Equally at training, you've got to assess how hard that training session is as to whether you need to be using or replacing lots of carbohydrate. So it's just making sure that we don't take on too many calories is something that we do need to be slightly considerate of. Um, in terms of protein, and I know Mariette actually emailed me in advance of this, um, especially in terms of veterans. Um, when you do um, a, a training session, especially if you do something that's gym related and you're doing uh, strength and conditioning specifically with weights and stuff, it is always good to have a protein uh, recovery drink because essentially you're um, helping recover the muscles recover and build stronger. And so actually one of the ways to do that is having protein afterwards. You can go and spend lots of money if you want on your whey supplements or whatever this, um, but actually a glass of milk, <laughs> chocolate milk is supposed to be one of the best recovery drinks you can have. Um, essentially, it needs to be animal protein. Um, obviously, some people are vegetarian and vegan. It doesn't have to be, but it does seem that uh, animal protein um, recovers. Um, it seems to be better for recovery than vegetable protein, but it doesn't mean that it is a waste of time, um, soya um, protein and all that. It's not, I'm not saying that don't use it, but um, leucine is the amino acid that seems to have the most effect. Um, and that's in animal uh, protein. In terms of um, sort of training, again, it's really about how hard you were training. Some, some trainings is more about tacti um, tactics and technical. 
And I wouldn't say that you would necessarily need a recovery drink from that. But if it's been a really hard sparring evening in terms of training, then yes, I would say uh, potentially having a, a, um, a protein drink afterwards is going to help. Because don't forget, a protein drink is high in calories. So it's just something that we need to be considerate of. Um, for veterans, now, um, unfortunately, as we get older, we, get, we lose muscle mass. It's a, a fact of life. And in particular, once you go over 50, um, muscle atrophy occurs more quickly. So obviously, the fact that we do exercise is beneficial because it prevents some of that muscle atrophy. And again, having protein to help repair muscles is always good. Um, for a younger person, you're probably looking at about 1.2 to 1.4 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. But as you are getting older and we've got less muscle mass and also training, unfortunately, tends to be lesser intensity just because of um, it's just the nature of, of training. Um, it tends to be about one to 1.25 grams per kilogram. And that's uh, what the literature is showing at the moment. Um, again, if competition I would be take, I would think a recovery drink would be really good in terms of protein after competition as well. I think that would help recover in terms of that side of it. So that's what I'm going to say about that at the moment. Um, I suspect that might be where some questions come later. Um, right. So um, functional foods, polyphenols. So you probably some of you might be aware of things like cherry juice, tart cherry juice. Um, there's other ones like black currant. Um, all these fruits and highly concentrated juices, actually, they have something called, well, they, they, they are, um, have poly, I can't talk, sorry, polyphenols in them. And these actually um, help us recover. And the literature is quite, um, is, is showing that they are quite beneficial for recovery. So these polyphenols basically mop, mop up something called reactive oxygen species. And this is what causes the inflammation or help, um, it's part of the cause of the inflammation in our muscles after exercise. And so these drinks can help mop up some of that and prevent some of the inflammation and damage that happens in the muscles. So having um, sort of, if you're gonna do a competition, maybe having something like cherry juice for the few days leading up to the competition might help reduce the um, DOMS that you experience afterwards. Um, and so that's sort of something that's also worthwhile considering. And cherry juice is probably one of the better ones. It's something we've done a lot of research in, but we tend to do our research in terms of health rather than recovery. But um, the literature is quite uh, conclusive in that in that regard. So here, if you look at this sort of infographic, you can see that there's a good level of evidence now for tart cherry juice having a beneficial effect, uh, beetroot juice, that tends to be more about endurance rather than uh, recovery. Um, and so these are some of the supplements that we, we know that has sort of a beneficial effect. And creatine, um, I would love to try an actual study with creatine and fencing, because uh, without question of a doubt, I think creatine would be beneficial in terms of recovery. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I would try and explain about creatine, but essentially um, when we do short bursts of efforts like a lunge, uh, which is very explosive, we're using um, our phosphocreatine system or sort of anything that's under 10 seconds of um, exercise, we're using our phosphocreatine system um, for energy. If we use that up, we need to replace it. If you take creatine supplementation, it means those repeated bouts with like less than 10 seconds um, uh, happen more effectively and so you actually improve performance and so that's why I think creatine would be really beneficial for fencing but I've yet to manage to, to research that. Um, active recovery, I know that some of you mentioned about active recovery, um, obviously the idea of this is that you keep your uh, muscles moving so you're getting rid of the lactic acid that's built up in the muscles during the exercise, um, you're clearing away other waste products as well, getting rid of carbon dioxide, lactate, uh, other th um, hydrogen ions and all this um, and increase oxygen delivery. Um, so, and, and this is what I think a lot of people have, have done in the past. And, and actually, if you look at the literature, ironically, um, the jury is still out. There's no evidence to show that active recovery actually um, is beneficial for recovery. It's not something that, um, it's, yeah, it's just, again, if, if it what's works for you though, um, psychologically, if, it, if you feel that this helps you, then it, there shows to be a benefit. But in terms of a physiological response, there's a good theory for it, but actually in terms of evidence, there seems very little evidence that active recovery actually um, improves uh, recovery. If we were to look at massage, and I know some of you mentioned massage, again, in theory, 
massage is supposed to be really beneficial. The idea is it's going to increase blood flow. It's going to help um, get rid of um, byproducts. Um, but the and I'm not as I said, I'm not really looking at it from an injury prevention. There's potentially a lot more um, benefit in terms of that. But in terms of recovery, in terms of going to the next day for performance, the literature really is um, not that conclusive. So um, a lot of it shows that there's no effect on repeated performances. There's no difference in physiological markers. Um, and actually, in some that's showing greater perceived recovery, well, basically, there seems to be greater perceived recovery than passive rest. So psychologically, it seems people think that massage is having a big benefit, but physiologically, there isn't so much evidence for it. Um, there seems to be very little evidence, um, differences in power or blood lactate, but this, this, this perception that it's going to have an effect is quite big. And I remember going to a conference oh God, quite a few years ago now, and it was um, by someone at UK Sport and they'd done their own sort of study and they've never published it. And I've always looked out for it. And this is where my, I think my real interest in recovery came from. And they said um, they did uh, their own study and they got um, they got people to have um, a massage from. Um, but they asked people if they liked massage. They had people that didn't like it and did like it. And they looked at these two groups of people. And then um, they got a normal masseuse to, to do the massage and they got a beautiful woman to do the massage. And these were all men. And um, they looked at like passive recovery and, and that was it. And they found that the one that, that improved um, recovery the best was the beautiful woman. Um, and it just shows that psychologically it has a massive impact. And, and, and that has really stuck in my mind. And, and there's, for some reason, they've never ever published that, and I just thought it's really interesting to 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 have that and in my mind. Um, I know that you guys talked about ice baths. Um, there's been a lot of conflicting research when it comes to ice baths as to whether it's beneficial. Some have shown sort of an, um, benefits if you've got to do exercise again in a two or three hours. Some have shown that there's detrimental to performance. If you're starting to look at another match sort of in 24 or 48 hours, it can actually be detrimental. So um, it, it does, the, the literature is, is, is all over the place with regards to, to cold water immersion or ice baths. Um, they do find that I think 10 to 15 degrees centigrade is supposed to be the best temperature for any effect, uh, if it's gonna be beneficial. Um, but yeah, it seems to be, the jury still seems to be out as to whether um, ice baths or, or, or cold water immersion is actually beneficial. Um, as I said though, some have actually shown that it to have a, a negative effect. And um, yeah, I think this is one of those particular studies here. So it's, it's, it's definitely controversial, the ice baths. But again, I think it's, if you feel like it's gonna benefit you, there's a psychological benefit without question of a doubt and, and people perceive it to, to help. And in terms of some of the muscle soreness, it has been shown to help a little bit in terms of muscle soreness, but not necessarily in, in terms of performance. Um, compression garments obviously is a more recent thing that people have started to look at. If you can have that external pressure on your limbs and you can um, help blood flow or get blood flow, um, the idea is it reduces swelling, um, it reduces pain, increases ranges of motion. So it's got a lot of theory behind it. Like all the other methods, active recovery, massage, um, all the theory is really good and they're all going to have a benefit um, to recovery. But in, in terms of actually what the literature shows, ironically, it's no enhancement of physiological markers, uh, but uh, and there, there seems to be a slight decrease in muscle soreness, but not a huge amount, but a little bit. So there is a little bit of evidence there, um, but mainly it's that perceived recovery. And again, that perceived recovery is a massive effect. Um, but in terms of physiology, there's not much seems to be happening. So if we were to look at the, the main recovery strategies, sleep definitely has an effect. We know that physiologically and psychologically it's going to help you recover. In terms of nutrition, there's certain elements of nutrition that we know is beneficial physiologically and psychologically. But in terms of these other things that we try to do, compression garments, massage, cold water, it's, it's not much evidence for it. There is a little bit, but not much. And uh, but what it is 
shown to have an effect is on psychological recovery. And we cannot underestimate the power of psychology in terms of uh, recovery and performance. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do them. But if you're looking from a, if you don't like ice baths, basically don't go and have an ice bath for recovery. It's going to have no effect for you whatsoever. If anything, it might even have a detrimental effect. But if you um, find that, that you can cope with them and it makes you feel better, then continue doing them or do it. It will help with recovery. And that's the sort of thing that that's the sort of uh, things that we that's sort of the outcome from from looking at the different recovery strategies. So if I go back to the original slide, not one of the one of my original slides that was looking at recovery for fencing. So obviously I've talked it, about it quite generically. But if we look at between points, I think mainly that's going to be a psychological, you know, you've got to repair yourself as you go back to the on guard line um, in terms of between fights. I think there's nutritional. So I think you could potentially have some carbohydrate depending on um, where you are in the competition. Caffeine is probably very beneficial at that point. Um, just keeping hydrated. So you've got fluids on board. Um, and someone mentioned cooling and I think I'm massive. I, I really generally believe that cooling will be beneficial for performance and fencing. Um, I'm still waiting for my student to, to completely finish his PhD and, and he's got a lot of um, uh, research in this area but cooling I think will show that it has quite a, an impact on on fencing um, and again that could be used be between fights um, in terms of sort of training recovery so it's between workouts it could be a fencing comp um, fencing training it could be your weights in the gym um, it all depends on what we call your training loads how hard was that training session and uh, one way just for you to, to make a note, if you're going to keep a training diary to see how things were going, you just basically one way is to, to have an RPE, which is um, your ratings of perceived exertion from 0 to 10 and multiply that by the uh, duration and minutes of your training session. That's one way people sort of look at it. Um, and basically that's then down to your hydration and protein, really, I would say, in terms of that training recovery. Um, if it was really, really hard, then you could start looking at other forms. But I think the key ones is around that sort of um, hydration, protein and, and sort of your nutritional replenishment. Um, in terms of competition recovery, which is a lot harder, um, I think it also depends when your next sort of training session is going to be or your next competition. As I said, if you're, if you're doing an individual and then you've got your team event and there's not much, then potentially you want to start looking at things like your ice bath, at your compression garments, um, at your massage, whatever you, I mean, personally, I would choose massage out of all of those. I would definitely go for a massage. That would, I think it's lovely. Um, and that would probably be what works best for me. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of thing where you want to start looking at your strategies there. Training camps, God, every day you want to make sure you've got some sort of recovery and otherwise you're going to be in a very difficult situation by the end. And again, though, it depends on what's available to you at a training camp. It's not that easy, um, but you could take, make sure you've got your nutritional uh, stuff, your hydration, um, and then probably something like a foam roller or something like that. Whatever works for you, though. I, personally, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I just stop. I just don't do anything. If I'm honest, I don't do anything. I never have, never will. I, I'm, if I was going to do anything, it'd probably be massage. But um, that's just, but that that's what works for me. That that's always been what works for me. But as I said, I think the theory, the the theme of it though, is it's down to what works for you. What's your personal preference? What do you want? What do you like? Um, something though in terms of um how to monitor recovery and fatigue, and I think this is another way to know whether you're recovered. Um. And I think some of you might have come across, well, there's all sorts of ways you can do it. I mean, we could go and take bloods in the lab and we, we can look at your creatine kinase, which is um, in the muscles. So we know that if you've got muscle damage, you're going to have elevations of creatine kinase, lactate dehydrogenase. Obviously, you can't go and do this. Um, so what a lot of um, football clubs and stuff have started to do is they've started to look at neuromuscular fatigue, things like counter movement jumps. Uh, so you do... Um, well counter movement jump can just be a, um, a vertical jump with using your arms um and reactive strength index where you you do like a drop jump and you just jump straight again um these sort of give you an idea of whether you're recovered so if your vertical jump performance isn't as high as it normally is then you know that you're you're, you're not recovered properly and so it's actually quite a good marker 
Um, and I just think this is something that we could simply do ourselves. You could you could have you could do a vertical jump. I think long jump is better for fencing because it's that more forward movement. We don't tend to do upward movement unless you see me trying to do a flash and I tend to go up instead of forwards. Uh, but essentially, we should be going forward. So I think like a long jump will be a good way to see if you're recovered. If I mean, it's not as you get older and your, your joints maybe aren't so good. Maybe just doing a hand grip test. Just do a hand grip and see if your hand grip strength is, is has recovered or um, I don't know, something simple that you can do. That is an idea of uh, recovery in terms of performance. So I'm pretty much at the end here. I'm just conscious of time. So we've got times for question. But essentially, when are recovery strategies most needed? When there's excessive overload without adequate rest, probably between competitions. Um, and uh, yeah, often some, some training sessions. Um, depends high frequency of competitions it could be lots of training when you've got more than three hours a day so it all depends on what you're doing but essentially i'm at the end of the uh, presentation so i was going to ask if people had questions and i see there's some stuff in the chat so i don't know beth if you want to bring up some of the stuff in the chat before we yeah. open up yeah so i um i'll just go back i did post um i did post for the girls for that link you uh, you suggested to go and see some of the science stuff where you had the infographic oh, no. from. Yeah. So in your chat, you should have a uh, basically you couldn't paste that uh, in. I'll try and remember to put it in any doc any stuff I send out to you all, so you have that as a an extra one. Um, so Simone had a great question in regards to uh, techniques that uh, help enable sleep. So if sleep is going to be a big part of the recovery process, competition does. Uh, does sort of create those stresses within ourselves and so sleep could be a problem um and 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 uh a power nap as well so is, is there any techniques for the girls to encourage in sleep i mean i use all sorts like chocolate or you know, hot drinks hot chocolate drinks i use i have a turmeric latte i've got lavender i've got sleep tapes which i listen so those are some of my strategies I think um, one of the, I mean, some of the things that they say is to not have any bright lights, you know, so you, the idea is not to use your phone um, sort of like an hour before going to sleep, sort of. Um, they even suggest no screen time, even watching TV. I, I, just, I personally, I find TV, the last thing at night, just watching a little bit of TV starts to relax me and reading my book. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just finding routines. I think I'm, I'm, I would definitely, I'll find a link to some of the sort of sleep health strategies, but most of it is um, just giving yourself time to relax before you go to sleep. Um, in terms of competition stresses though, I think it's it's probably learning to do things like meditation, <laughs> and, um, trying to relax and stop yourself going off into thoughts there, but it's really around, yeah, lights, not eating too late. Um, and um, definitely not using your phone so much. A lot of people find uh, reading can be generally um, beneficial going going to bed. Um, so I, I know there's more than that, but my brain has stopped. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think there is there is a fair bit of yes resources that you can certainly yeah. look up on on that. And uh, I agree. I, I've used lots of lots of strategies. So uh, creatine. So John brought up a question: Are there any downsides that you know of in terms of taking creatine substitutes or supplements rather? So actually, um, I actually facilitated a, um, a, a talk with my students recently with uh, an expert on creatine, and he honestly and truthfully believes there's no negatives to creatine. Um, the, the, the main negative that there might potentially be is it, it uh, basically um, you take on board a little bit more water, you retain more water. So um, increases muscle mass, but it also increases a slight increase in water retention. So essentially you might get an increase in weight. So um, if you're looking in terms of power, um, yes, you've got increased muscle mass, but if you've got a slight increase in weight, um, it could have a slight uh, negative effect, but it's, it's very minimal. And I think the benefits tend to outweigh the positives. There are still some people who don't respond, so it's one of these things, if people were to take creatine supplementation, I'm assuming there's no one under 18 here anyway. <laughs> I don't think there is. Um, yeah, so if you're going to take creatine supplementation, I would look at, do your own little performance test because some people don't respond. So what's the point in taking it? But no, as far as I'm aware, there's very little, all the stuff that people are wary of, um, supposedly kidney issues, 
it, it's not really that there, there's really it's you'd have to take ridiculous amounts and go beyond what's recommended and that's not the case really so um yeah no there, there doesn't seem to be many negatives to take creatine supplementation and i, I generally think it would be beneficial for defensing i i that sort of uh, uh, constant lunges and explosive movements is what creatine's best at it's getting that uh, with any supplementation you have to be wary about any contamination so creatine in itself yeah. is an approved supplement yes. as long as there's no potential of contamination so anybody who's looking for supplementation uh, they need to check um there's a, a website called global dro uh which is always look you can see there's but they batch test uh a lot of the the main products that you, you can get available so but i wouldn't like to think anybody was was um you know was having a drugs test and this was the problem supplements to be fair that you only take any supplements that has and I, i'm trying to think what the label is on it um again i'll have to check that out but you really only want to take any supplements that has the um the label that says that it's okay for athletes basically mm. i just need to double check what that is but yeah I, I wouldn't take anything that is outside that doesn't have that um a, a certified label on it that says it's fine so we've got a hand up from Simone. Uh, so if you want to unmute Simone, or is there a question that I can use in the chat? No, it's just a comment about my question about sleep, because I was more wondering if any of the other recovery techniques would help if you're trying to go for a power nap, for example, but you're still all fired up. Okay, so um, obviously not having caffeine. <laughs> if you're fired up, but you're trying to relax for your nap. Um, I think to be fair, it's going to be a psychological thing I, in terms of um, trying to get yourself prepared for a, a sleep. It's going to be psychological trying to calm yourself down. Um, unfortunately, that's not my my area of expertise. So I'm not going to say something that is probably incorrect. So, um, but yeah, I'd, I, yeah, I'll probably take yourself to a quiet room um, and try and think of or try and relax somehow. But in terms of the other techniques, um, in terms of sleeping for a nap, I, I couldn't see that they would particularly help. So Andy, uh, as somebody who's worked in the Middle East, uh, certainly has, has commented with regards to cooling uh, as something that would help. So if obviously if you're competing or training in countries are very hot, uh, having a strategy, uh, so planning for that, um, I would certainly recommend. I've, I've certainly competed in lots of hot countries uh, and I had strategies to to have something to cool me down. So whether it's a, a, a towel full of uh, ice cubes or just trying to keep a uh, cloth in, in cold water has always helped me. Um, I, there's something from Marionette, Marriott with regards to abruprofen as a strategy. Is this something that, that has been um, it depends what in what context um, is it you're talking about training so the, the issue that we have uh, with inflammation is it's actually beneficial so um, if you're getting inflammation from a workout like uh, so you're just doing it from training in terms of um, you know you've done a weight session or you've done a heavy fencing session and you get inflammation it's actually your body repairing itself and then the muscles are going to repair stronger so you don't technically want to get rid of that inflammation all the time because then actually you're, you're going to prevent the muscles from repairing effectively. But in terms of competition and you've got to go and do another competition, yeah, ibuprofen, ibuprofen could be beneficial. But in terms of like training, it could actually be detrimental. It's the same with something like cherry juice and such. You know, it's good in terms of muscle soreness and recovery, but actually you are potentially blunting that, that beneficial repairing system. Um, there's, if people, there is a lot in the chat and I'm just going through it to make sure I, I pick up on, cause Simone's got some great questions. And so I'm trying to balance all the questions out. Um, Duncan has just come back to the creatine sub supplement is the amount. So, it, but you, you did say that you haven't done any science on this. So, um, but he's just asking what amount of creatine It's obviously it's a new thing and <laughs> Duncan wants another little advantage. <laughs> to be fair, if you go and buy the uh, creatine supplementation, it, the, it will actually tell you the best loading strategy. So some people take like a massive dose and then they just take a, um, which is a loading dose and then they just take smaller amounts every day. Um, apparently you can keep on taking it for days and days and days. It doesn't matter. Um, and I think it's, 
the best sort of strategy I'm I'm trying to remember so I, I don't hold me to this I think it's like 25 grams and then five grams every day but I can't rem- to be fair I'm, I am I haven't done it for a while so but I know for the fact that the um it's just yeah I, I, you know what Duncan I'm going to message you on Facebook when I have my exact answer I just don't want to get myself in the in the wrong here <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just going back to a, uh, a question with, with Simone, because it's the, the juice, the, the fruit. Is the fruit uh, as a whole as good as the, the fruit juice in terms of that? So or basically, you- something like the tart cherry juice, you're talking about something like 200 cherries um, that are crushed into that juice that you're having that's going to have a beneficial effect. So you wouldn't be able to <laughs> sit in there to eat like 200 cherries to get that one shot is is, is, is quite hard. So, um, yeah, no, that's why these concentrated uh, drinks are, are where it's beneficial. Um, Elliot Grover, uh, again, uh, he's put in the, the chat with regards to the supplements uh, and a range of supplements that are available. Um, so that is a, something that Elliot's that's put into this group. So if you want to contact Elliot directly about that, um, you know, he could he could do that. It's it's something I um, that, that's between you, you two, basically. Uh, but I've no problem with Elliot mentioning that. So thank you. Um, I think I think I've gone through there's some great suggestions in terms of like headspace for meditation there's a lot of apps out there i use calm as an app a lot it's got stories it's got mindfulness it's got but there is a lot of apps at the moment um, you could use Uh, so there's some great tips people have there's um can you use so mariette's mentioned can you use a fitbit monitor uh, to monitor your recovery uh, recovery rate so I think Mariette is really interested in this heart rate and understanding your recovery status and Fitbit was mentioned. My problem with these, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the ones that have the heart rate going through the wrist. Unfortunately, they're so inaccurate. I, I wouldn't rely on it, to be perfectly honest. It's uh, they're, they're highly inaccurate. Um, so I wouldn't really use that. If you're going to look at heart rate in terms of recovery, I would use a belt around the chest. Um, so uh yeah um you could the best measure for a heart rate is heart rate recovery um heart rate variability to be perfectly honest um which only certain heart rate monitors would do so i i think one thing that in terms of um knowing whether you're in a good place is taking your resting heart rate in the morning and that's a good indicator of where like how recovered you are so it's taking your heart rate before you wake up and I, I actually think the watches probably aren't too bad in terms of that. So the Fitbit is probably not too bad in that sense. But in terms of um, anything else, any more accuracy than that, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it. Uh, so coming back to a question Simone puts uh, in the chat: Have the physiological and stroke psychological effects of stretching been assessed? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I hate to say it. Um, but actually the physiological is showing that stretching is detrimental. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, um, I guess it depends why you're doing the stretching. In terms of recovery, I think it's detrimental. And that seems to be what the literature is showing. It's either having no effect or it's slightly detrimental. I actually think in terms of if you want to increase your flexibility, actually stretching at the end is probably the best time to be doing it. And that's to help your flexibility. So it depends on the reasons if you're doing stretching in terms of recovery. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's not looking good. Uh, it's, it's not, yeah, it's, there's very little support out there for it. Um, but I do think at the end of a workout, if you're wanting to improve flexibility, which actually for fencing is probably quite beneficial in terms of your lunge distance and your your reach distance, having a stretch is still potentially be- is, is definitely beneficial, just for a different reason, not for recovery. Uh, 